Um, as I'm sure many people said, uh, I've got the easy task. I just have to facilitate conversation. Um, but this one should be should be quite interesting, I think. So um, the conversation is whether banks make better partners or competitors. And I think, you know, just listening to a few of the sessions, everyone's thinking about what's the role of sort of fintech in providing platforms um, and how can they support you know, support the industry, but how can they leverage banks as well to do that? And you know, I think it's obviously a, a clear, a clear answer is where they're playing outside of the risk space that banks are in. Um, but what happens when they start to overlap with that industry, uh, with, with that space? And in particular, where should banks be looking to compete in terms of building internal capabilities and and sort of protecting their their core custom set? And where should they look to leverage um, their capabilities? And obviously, there's a sort of broad spectrum of answers to that. But we've got a panel of people here from the banks today. Um, I'm very interested to hear their perspectives on you know, where they see you know, natural partnerships and where they think actually building that internal capability is, is, is required. So I'm just going to hand over briefly um, uh, to the guys to do a, a quick introduction and then I'll get into some specific questions. Thank you. Uh, I'm Martin Barrett. So I'm the managing director for a small bank called Oswide Bank. Uh, it used to be uh, a building society called Wide Bay Australia, but uh, listed on the stock exchange, an organisation that is looking to grow. Uh, and really, it's that growth ambition that led us to uh, our partnership uh, with Money Place and an exploration of um, all things fintech. Thanks, Martin. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name's Toby Norton Smith. I'm uh, a relatively recent addition to CBA. I've been uh, at the bank for about 18 months. And um, the purpose of our team is really to bring a dedicated focus to product and service extensions uh, beyond the traditional banking model. Um, so the scope of that is fairly broad. Uh, it absolutely uh, covers fintech and, and, of course, alternative lending uh, within that. Um, but it also uh, broadens uh, into sort of digital adjacencies, so be they B2C or, or B2B models that, that we see, we also keep an eye on. And of course, uh, you know, ultimately the application of any of those business models by global technology players is also of, of great interest um, to our team. So um, I thought just, just to sort of put it in context a little bit, obviously CBA is a very big place. And um, we've made a very explicit decision um, not to centralise innovation. So just sort of explaining that our team is, is only one of those bits of capability within the bank that sort of helps uh, bring that innovation lens. Um, we sort of focus on effectively a business-led or st strategic type of innovation, but there are uh, other groups within the bank who um, have done a lot of um, technology-focused innovation, a lot of our activities in, in blockchain and, and AI and other initiatives. And also we have an innovation lab which, which equally has teams that focus on more sort of proof-of-concept developments as well. Hi everyone, I'm Ben Parham and I run uh, personal banking and our corporate development and strategy teams within the Banking and Financial Services Group, which is one of Macquarie's six operating groups. Okay, thanks guys. So, so Ben, I thought I'd, I'd just start with you, um, having a slightly a broader sort of international perspective. Um, what is it that you currently like about the fintech space and, and what it's doing for industry? I think there's, um, there's a bunch of things. First of all, sort of customer centricity. We, we've focused a lot of time uh, trying to partner with digital lenders, understanding what you're doing, um, potentially from a capital perspective and also from an equity perspective. And, uh, and the first thing is just a customer-centric approach that you have. The second would be the deep use of data and analytics, much better, I think, than the traditional lenders have had. Um, and we're seeing that in different forms around the world. And the third thing would be reducing friction in the system, making it more efficient for borrowers and, uh, and lenders to connect. So in the division that I work in, and that's just one of uh, six operating groups, as I mentioned, in Macquarie. So we're a large global organisation, and there are lots of people doing many things around the world. I can't speak on behalf of the whole group. But in the division that I'm in, we are uh, collaborating with some of our colleagues from the United States, our New York team in commodity and financial markets in discussions with a number of, uh, of US lenders, uh, both on the lending side, the financing side, and on the equity side, um, hoping to partner with them uh, in the United States and potentially bring some of their activities into Australia. Thanks. And, and just on that, um, I know that you have some views on this. And this is going to be interesting for the, for the group here. But where do you think banks should be cautious about considering how and where to play in the space? So what are the sort of key things you'd look out for? 
Yeah, I think, um, well, certainly we're cautious um, about a couple of things. Um, and I'm not saying definitively one way or the other on these topics. I think they're interesting topics for all of us to, to think about, both the established players, traditional players, and, and the new players. Uh, the first is I think the jury's still out whether we are seeing a systemic wide expansion of capital or whether we're seeing a more efficient system of allocating capital and financing. And, I mean, really that story will play out probably over, um, over a decade or more, so I don't think anyone can really know the answer today. But we pause and reflect on whether what we're seeing is uh, a more efficient allocation of capital or a systemic economy-wide expansion of capital. And obviously there's been many examples in history of, uh, of the economy expanding capital beyond, beyond the level it can take. Um, so that's the first thing we, we pause on. The second thing we pause on is whether originators should also hold some of the, uh, some of the loans that they originate. And you see different models of that around the world. You see different models of that here in Australia. Um, Lending Club, for example, has been spectacularly successful in their originations, but they philosophically don't believe that they should uh, or will hold any of the loans that they originate. And we look at that um, and it troubles us because I think what you see um, as a sort of a countervailing trend globally is regulators insisting more and more on risk retention, particularly when it comes to the securitization markets. So um, again, I think the jury's out on whether, um, whether, that, will, whether that will happen or not um, here in Australia. You see different models in Australia, I think, um, and so I'm not, not gonna comment on whether those models are right or wrong, I think we just pause and reflect on, on whether it's right that the originator of the loan is going to be completely risk off once they've sold that loan down. When um, Santander sold about a billion dollars of loans to JP Morgan that they had bought from Lending Club, um, I, you know, I don't know that anyone knows the, the real story behind that, but I think part of the story is the difficulty in securitising those loans and a large part of that trouble is the, um, is the lack of retention by the originator. Okay, thank you. All right, Toby, if we just, just move on to you. Um, talked a bit about your role in innovation. I'd like to get some more perspectives on why CBA has decided to go down the role of focusing on partnerships. Sure. Um, I think everyone in this room is probably familiar with the sort of broad shift in language uh, concerning the relationships between uh, banks and, and fintechs in this space. I think um, coming out of Finnovate Europe, the latest sort of terminology is around uh, fintech carnivores and herbivores. Um, which I love as an analogy because it's the first time that a bank is not cast as a dinosaur in the, um, in the story. So um, if I was to work with that analogy or sort of uh, torture it a little bit, um, I think it's fairly clear that uh, as a bank w we don't see a, um, a meteorite approaching. Um, what we do see though, what, what we see in our team and our objective is that we see that the pace of um, evolution has increased. Uh, and it's only going to continue to increase. And when we think about the banks that are going to survive in that sort of environment, um, they need to be digital leaders um, and they need to be incredibly uh, nimble. And we think partnerships are one of the tools that allow us to be nimble um, in a couple of ways, really. Um, nimble in uh, use and access to um, capital and talent. So if I think about the broader sort of fintech environment, I think we're all familiar with numbers suggesting that there was over $14 billion worth of venture capital invested in fintech in 2014. And with that, the, the sort of talent that, that we're all familiar with that is associated with it, that's an incredible pool of um, innovation for uh, banks to tap into. Uh, if I turn to our partners themselves on deck, I mean, they've raised over 200 million of equity capital um, in the US, which is focusing on a very specific problem and funnel. Um, so again, a wonderful opportunity to learn from them. I think the other nimbleness is, is frankly, in, in speed and the breadth of opportunities that we can explore through partnerships. So from when our conversations with ONDEC got serious um, to when we will be in a position to start um, introducing the product and opportunity to our customers is a matter of a few months. Um, and for all of those people who are familiar with how a bank works, that's, that's an incredible achievement and um, partnerships is really the key there. A um, cu couple of sort of criteria, I think, wh while we're talking about partnerships that's worth um, sharing with the room that, that, that we take to those partnerships. 
Um, to draw on uh, Ian's analogy that he gave earlier of partnerships being a marriage, um, we think on deck may be the one, you know, uh, they're looking pretty good. Um, but we absolutely have a principle and, and within my team an obligation to only start um, quite small and to scale relationships. So I guess at this stage of the relationship we've sort of left the toothbrush in the apartment and, uh, and we'll go from there. Maybe the apartment keys are next, but um, that's, that's absolutely the approach we will take. It allows us to, to, do, to do more partnerships. I think the second criteria that uh, we uh, will take as a bank in these sorts of business-led partnerships is to focus on uh, proven or more proven business models um, or uh, management teams. And that's absolutely demonstrated in the uh, relationship with OnDeck. Thanks. And just on that, I'm, I'm interested sort of thinking about our topic. Where do you draw the line between sort of using an external partner to help get you into the market quickly versus sort of building up internal capabilities? And if we look at Amex, for example, explored partnerships for a couple of years in the SME lending space and then ended up building their own internal model and, and did very well with that. How, how do you see that sort of balance working? Because I think it's, it's probably a, a tension that will exist for, for, for a while going forward. Uh, yep, I think it's a healthy tension. Um, I think I heard someone discussing some, some of the other banks. We haven't chosen to go into a uh, sort of corporate venture fund structure, but uh, someone else was referencing that bank's decision as being a way of creating some additional tension al almost within the bank for, for where capital was allocated and, and how it was passed around. I mean, for us, uh, I don't think it's an either or. Uh, it's absolutely, uh, if we think about the small business space and particularly that sort of micro small business space, the sort of less than a million dollars turnover space, uh, you know, this is, this is a great area for CBA to um, innovate in. You know, we actually, you know, recognise that there's a tremendous uh, amount that we need to do there. Our um, share of uh, bank customers, uh, small business customers in that space is around 20, 25% of the market. Um, our share of lending is significantly lower than that. Um, so a big opportunity, and, and that's reflected in both structural changes that have occurred at the bank, but also, uh, you know, we've recently uh, released our own uh, pro uh, product, a simple business overdraft, um, and, and also this partnership with OnDeck. So I think for us, it's um, it's certainly not an either or, a bit of both. Okay, thank you. All right, Martin, uh, why don't we come to you? Now, I think um, you've got some interesting perspectives, probably from uh, more of the, the smaller sort of regional um, banking uh, and where... You know, I think you see some opportunities um, that offered uh, buying or renting technology offers for that space that you, you wouldn't normally be able to get access to. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I'll, I'll cover off a little bit on the smaller ADI perspective, I think, because I do think in the bigger ADIs, the big banks, there there is a general sort of conflict that potentially exists with this particular industry, but I don't see that conflict in the smaller ADI space. Um, when you look across building societies, credit unions, small banks like ourselves, you're limited in generally in terms of your um, investment capability. You're limited in terms of your entrepreneurial flair within the organisation. Um, and you're looking really to achieve that aspiration of growth. Now, when you look at entrepreneurial flair, when you look at the capability that sits in the fintech space, uh, it actually makes, to my mind, uh, very, uh, uh, very sound logic uh, to actually uh, partner with uh, fintech players. But importantly, fintech players, I think, that can demonstrate a level of capability. Um, at the end of the day, this is a game of risk. So if in the fintech space and you're looking uh, to provide loans, it is about risk. Uh, and as a financial organisation, big or small, you're clearly uh, concerned about reputation. Uh, you're clearly also concerned about sustainability. Uh, and uh, we believe uh, that, you know, those are things that really, really do matter. Uh, and, and in terms of our relationship, our new relationship with Money Place, they were the types of things that we were really, really um, impressed with. We were impressed with the, uh, the origination thought uh, we were impressed with the entrepreneurial flavour and we were also impressed uh, with the skills and the capability of the, the team. So all those things together really did uh, play through to us to think, well, these are the guys to partner with. Uh, and uh, that partnership allows for our organisation, we hope in the longer term, uh, to benefit from the uh, growth that that will, uh, that will bring and the two organisations can complement each other. Thank you. 
Um, just want to throw out sort of one question to the panel here, and, and conscious who we have in the audience, but just interested in perspectives regarding the regulatory challenge relating to fintech partnerships. And this is all, all around, you know, security concerns, storing data on the cloud, using an online platform, and, and, and the partnership. So, would anyone on the panel like to just give perspectives on that? Can I kick off on that one? Please do. Yeah. Um, we uh, we clearly uh, needed to uh, to go through a journey with the uh, with the regulator and all banks are regulated by uh, APRA. Um, I think uh, what I saw with uh, APRA was actually a, a real interest in learning more about the uh, fintech space. We actually took Money Place to APRA uh, and had APRA uh, present uh, to them, and I think that gave them gave them a level of comfort. No ADI is really going to make uh, meaningful um, steps in terms of the fintech space without getting uh, the regulator comfortable about it. Uh, it's important for a number of things. Firstly, risk weights. Um, we need to make sure that any money we're putting through the platform come with the right risk weights so that we're not heavily capital burdened and i.e. the costs are too high. Uh, but we also need the regulator to be uh, very confident about the origination and fraud processes um, that uh, are there behind the fintech player as well. Because ultimately APRA is there to make sure uh, that there is sustainability in the system. Uh, and uh, any ID ADI uh, needs to be satisfying APRA, as it needs to satisfy itself, <laughs> uh, that uh, you know, any of its uh, practices, lending practices, are uh, sustainable for the long term and for the benefit of its uh, customers. Thanks. Anything to add to it? Um, not too much to add. I mean, I think it's a, you know, it's a classic sort of paradox or challenge that the regulators face. There's this... Um, ultimately an obligation to look after consumers and, and that, you know, that takes two folds. It's, uh, it's about protecting consumers from risk uh, and then at the same time encouraging um, competition and innovation. And, and I think regulators um, in all markets and increasingly we're seeing it here are actually doing a terrific job of trying to sort of wrestle um, with that paradox as indeed my view is uh, are the banks um, sort of maintaining um, their uh, engagement with the regulators while also trying to push for opportunities through things like sort of data sand pits and innovation labs and, and for some banks, um, venture capital um, arms to try and innovate um, outside of that um, traditional framework. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't think I've got anything more specific than that to add. That's right. Okay, now I realise I've got, well, this is a slightly different panel, so we've got banks sitting up here now, um, and a lot of uh, fintech people sitting in the audience. So I thought I'd open up um, the panel to some questions for the last 10 minutes. Uh, anything you'd like to ask the guys here about uh, competing versus partnering? Definitely silence. I know it's close to lunch. Thanks. Uh, Rob Young at OnDeck. Um, I'm, I'm just interested, I see, you know, we go talk to a lot of banks around the world and, and interesting to see how some react to the digital challenge. Well, one that strikes me a lot that's interesting that, that we follow, we, we partner with in the US as well, B BBVA have taken very definitive steps where the digital leader in the, in the business is effectively now the CEO and they, they talk a lot, lot about their digital transformation as, as a bank, as an entity as an organization. So just, just wondering if you have any, any views on that and kind of any thoughts on, on that transformation from, from, the, from the bank organization perspective. I'm happy to start on that. I'm happy to start on that. Um, because uh, yeah, your partnership with BBVA obviously is, is well known. We, we regard BBVA very highly as a, as a global leader in the transformation of traditional banking to digital banking. And uh, in fact, we hired the head of digital transformation from BBVA about 18 months ago. Luis Aguna joined us here in, in Sydney. Uh, he was responsible for BBVA's digital transformation globally prior to coming to our, our firm. And, uh, and you're right that the importance of digital transformation has just sort of leapt up the hierarchy. So we sort of organise a lot of what we do now around how we can become a digital lender. Obviously, in our case, Macquarie doesn't have a branch network, so uh, unlike the um, most of the other banks here, 
w we regard digital as our as our main channel to market. It's incredibly important for us. I'm happy to jump in from a um, CBA perspective, uh, Rob. I mean, e equally, of course, we see the imperative of digitisation as being absolutely critical. It's uh, it's both, um, of course, an opportunity and a threat for any bank. It's sort of what digitisation does to the customer experience and journey is means that those sort of traditional barriers between a value chain uh, are eroded. And so, obviously, for a bank, it's um, uh, an opportunity for us to play in other uh, profit pools, but obviously also an opportunity for others to uh, enter ours. Um, in terms of digitisation and the journey, sort of, C you know, CBA will, will always be on. It's extremely eye-opening for us when we do have those opportunities to catch up with um, uh, US peers or uh, European-based peers. It really is quite striking how strongly positioned uh, we are in Australia, uh, and, and particularly um, CBA's proposition, in my view. Um, the um, a level of investment that we have been able to invest in digital and that's, and that's required um, has been sustained really through a period of time when you know a lot of banks globally had um, uh, z zero or negative ROEs and didn't have that opportunity to um, keep investing. So we've really got to make sure that we um, make the most of that platform that we've built. Um, you know, uh, our app, for example, has over three point or around 3.5 million active users. So tremendous sort of. Uh, opportunities for us and I think you know w what's interesting is when you see digitization actually leading to um, different outcomes so to, to put a bit of meat behind that sort of observation of us versus others um, you know if you think about the push out here around um, uh, contactless payments um, and then the associated sort of digital wallets that drive some of those things uh, across all banks you know that has um, has led to a different outcome to you know, what we've seen in the US and indeed you know, the partnerships in the US that some banks have, have, have done with Apple uh, in terms of sort of uh, what outcomes it, it, it generates. So um, digitisation is, uh, you know, I sit within the digital uh, part of the bank and it absolutely is the motivator for the, for the, for the work that we do around partnerships as well. Yeah, I think uh, digitisation uh, generally tends to be a bit of a buzzword around the uh, the industry, and particularly around banks uh, right now, as we're all sort of scrambling to try and define what actually that is. Um, you know, digitisation in terms of back office, trying to improve the cost base. Digitisation in terms of product and how you actually get more product out to uh, customers, how it tries to solve for uh, you know a customer problem rather than trying to find a problem uh, to solve. Um, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, from a scale of smaller ADI perspective, uh, the digitisation piece is important to us. We only have a limited amount of resource we can put to that, so to turn it around again to the partnership piece, those partners that can provide opportunity for us in that particular space uh, to reach out to customers uh, will be, I think, important uh, uh, partners for, uh, for the small ADI space. Right, um, I shall probably interrupt because I feel lunch is beckoning. Uh, but I have one question actually for all of you. Um, um, you, you, met some, you think you just mentioned Apple um, and you mentioned BBVA, which of course had Simple, Simple Bank. Um, the ambition of Simple Bank was to replace you lot, not to help you, yeah, to replace you, get rid of you, yeah. Um, and BBVA bought it, sadly and now we'll use it not to replace you. Um, Apple want to replace you, don't they? And th isn't the next generation, next iteration of what's coming down the track is not technology that will enable you to do a better job, but is simply to replace you in the customer's journey? Um, look, I mean, the ambitions of Apple and Google and so forth are, are you know, hard to predict. They probably change a lot, but certainly when we talk to them, um, they're not interested in being a regulated financial services business. Um, they're interested in participating heavily in the space. Uh, and obviously the payments area is just uh, incredibly um, active in terms of disruption. But that's at the level of customer interface rather than at the level of, of the rails that actually run the payment system. So um, I've got no doubt that Apple's got big aspirations and obviously a lot of cash to, uh, to do whatever they like. But um, in terms of sort of the next evolution of change, I don't see that coming so much from uh, from Apple and Google. So I do you think, think that next, there are four or five names in Australia, four or five names in the UK, they're still going to be around in 20 years' time. None of the people in this room are going to replace you. 
Uh, yeah, I think the uh, the existing banks are going to be here in 20 years' time for sure. But in terms of brand recognition, you'll be the top five names. Or, sorry, apologies. But even in amongst the challenger banks, none of the people here are really going to replace you banks. I, I, personally, I don't see us being replaced, no. I think the, the theme of this conference is focused a lot on partnering in new mm. uh, ways that loans can be originated in a more efficient way. But I, I'd be very, very surprised if... Uh, if the largest five banks in Australia weren't still the largest five banks in yeah, Australia in, in 20 years' time. <laughs> I, I, look, uh, I, I think, um, I think uh, the biggest risk for banks generally uh, is confusing uh, apathy for loyalty. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and that is that, you know, if we're lousy at the customer experience, yeah. um, if we treat our customers with a level of contempt, um, if we're not focusing our efforts on, in terms of that customer experience, uh -huh. then ultimately we will perish. Uh, it's inevitable. Um, but if we can get those pieces right, um, if we can have a purpose for a, uh, and a meaningful uh, uh, relationship uh, with those particular customers, and if we can, as I said before, if we can um, you know, uh, match uh, what we lack with what's on offer in the marketplace from uh, new entrepreneurs, then, hey, um, I see no reason why we wouldn't be around for some time to come. I oh, just want another side question as well. I mentioned a bit earlier about um, a Lord Turner, one of the regulators in the UK, expecting there to be massive losses in the alternative finance sector. You're all wizened, you're all wizened bank experts. Do you think he's right? Do you think this sector is going to see big, big losses in the next three or four years? I, I don't want to comment on the magnitude or big, big, but I, I think people with far wiser views than mine have said that there hasn't been a shake-up yet, and you know, in Australia, economically more broadly, there hasn't been a shake-up for a long time. So, uh, you know, absolutely, a there quantum will be. more than we would experience in the next recession, do you reckon? I'm not sure what that quantum <laughs> would be. Oh, look, I mean, let, let me let me um, just give you a bit of a flavour in terms of, and I'm sort of talking about money place here. We spent quite some time going through Money Places systems. We went through quite some time going through uh, their origination policies and processes. And I've got to say, I walked away pretty impressed. Okay. Um, so, you know, uh, as far as I could see, if as long as uh, uh, fintechs have those robust, pro robust processes, yep. they have systems and they follow them, they don't get tempted to weaken them because yep. of a growth ambition, if they follow them, um, then you know I think that um, there should be no reason why their default levels are any higher okay. than those that sit in uh, uh, banks. Well, great. Well, look, great panel. Thank you very much. Put your hands together for the panel, and thank you, thank you very much, Chris, for enabling it.